Again, as always, please like, subscribe. You can do that on Apple, Spotify, all those locations to find the podcast. We have a very special guest today, a national champion. If you ask him, he's the best shooter in NC State history. Uh, <laughs> he's become a good friend of mine. And, you know, I played in his, his Wittenberg Foundation tournament this year. So we had a good time for that. Uh, please welcome Derek Wittenberg. Well, thank you very much. I have so much respect for your career and what you did. And I'm glad you came all the way from Indiana to NC State. Uh, you had an outstanding career. And like I said, you are one of the best shooters <laughs> that ever came to NC State. Not the best. So, but hey, me and you are in the same category, right? One hey, of the best shooters in if, if I can, if I can be in that category, I did something right down down the line. So absolutely, absolutely. So let's let's kind of bounce into it. So, um, usually I ask like what people are doing now, but I'm I'm more interested in Dematha hoops. <laughs> so it's kind of where it all started. And I know a lot of people know Dematha is like a mecca for college basketball players. Kind of touch on that experience. I know obviously you were co my coach for two years. Coach Lowe was there. So kind of touch on that and what that kind of did for you to develop you into a basketball player. Well, you know, I had the honor and the privilege of playing for the first high school coach in the Hall of Fame, the late Morgan Wooten, who died earlier this year. And uh, what, what a man, he taught us more than basketball. You know, his philosophy of, you know, of uh, God, family, education, and basketball, it, it, leans, it, it, it looms to be true um, in, in what we have to deal with today. And I learned so much from him. I mean, we won a lot of games. We won his first national championship game and uh, national, national championship in uh 78 we went undefeated 28 no sydney and i your your coach we only lost seven games in high school and uh so we when we came to nc state we didn't know we understood the process of being a champion you mm -hmm. know the work ethic the time and score uh what kind of people what kind of teammates you need to be what uh you had to be coachable we had all those intangible things so that what I learned at DeMatha was invaluable in terms of not just being a good basketball player, but being a good person and a good student. Yeah, and, I'll, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't really think about is it's a big jump going from high school to college. And then when you have, you know, a really good coach and a really good program, it's almost like that in between where – you know, you're constantly getting better and it's not like you're playing full on, you know, a Carolina or Duke, but you're playing, you know, some lower division one talent every day while you're there. I mean, you got to think you have practices five, six days a week and you're playing college high division one talent every day. It's only going to make you better for that next jump and uh, to, to go to, you know, NC State or wherever they end up going. Yeah, uh, we obviously we played against great competition, not only just within our team, mm -hmm. but we were in the Catholic League in Washington, D.C. It was one of the best leagues in the country with yep. Don Zach and Paul of Six and, and St. John's. And we, we had some great teams. That we, and plus, DeMatha played a national schedule. Yeah. So we went on the road and played uh, West Philly and, and all the top teams in the country. So we were unique. We was a national high school team that really uh, was prepared all the way around but more importantly, Scott, you probably didn't know this. Sydney and I didn't start at DeMatha when we came there. We <laughs> could have started at any high school team in the country. But DeMatha, the way uh, that the system worked is that the seniors were, were had an opportunity to start, but he sold us on the fact that we could finish the game. Yeah. And so when you went to college and you didn't start right, we were prepared to handle coming off the bench and being prepared. A lot of people couldn't handle that. Yeah, because if you were a star player coming from high school and you were the star averaging 30 some points a game and all of a sudden you come to college, there's other good players and you're not starting. It's psychologically it's hard to handle that. So but we had had a taste of that. And we we understood how to handle that and be patient. And, and a lot of times we finished the game anyway. So uh, that, that was good. And it taught us how to be a good teammate and how to be a part of the team. And Roy talking about character and your attitude. Yeah, and I think uh, 
all my greatest coaches always the, the first thing they would tell me is it doesn't matter if you start it matters who finishes because yeah, right. at the end of the that's game right. is when that's when you're gonna make your money right there so so kind of talk about you know DeMath is coming to an end you're you know the end of your career in high school talk about that recruiting process obviously we know you ended up coming to NC State uh there's a coaching change going on kind of around that time frame as well. Talk about you deciding to go to NC State, and was there anybody else that was really in consideration for you? Well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, obviously I had, a, a, um, you know, recruiting was a lot different then. It wasn't as with the social media. It wasn't as uh, uh, at the high profile. But because we were at DeMatha, we were highly recruited. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my recruiting process was uh, it was obviously competitive. A lot of other programs are interested. Uh, Notre Dame and Penn State and and uh, Rutgers was very interested. The, the teams that uh, that had the most interest in the ACC was Clemson, um, NC State, and Maryland because Lefty Giselle was at Maryland, and so. Um, it was a it, it was an interesting uh, process for me because in my mind, because my cousin David Thompson went there, in my mind, I always had an eye for NC State. NC yeah. State was always my first choice. Now I would have liked Maryland because I liked Lefty Giselle and it was close to home, and I wouldn't have mind going to Maryland. But NC State, in the back of my mind, was my first choice. And then as soon as that opportunity presented itself, I I signed at NC State, and that's where I wanted to be. And I tell guys all the time, even the kids now, to guys, NC State was my first choice. This is where I wanted to be. And, um, and, and, and that's why I'm so comfortable and appreciative of, of taking this opportunity at, at State. So my recruiting was, wasn't as difficult as many other recruiting. Well, it's, it's safe to say that we, uh, especially NC State fans and, and former athletes like myself, you made the right decision because you paved – you paved the way for a lot of us to to have, you know, a big program to come to and two national championships up there on the in the banner. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people are glad that was your first decision. <laughs> yeah, it was. You know what? I love Norm Sloan. Um, uh, and then uh, he left. And then, you know, when Jimmy Valvano came in, we didn't kind of know what to expect. Mm -hmm. But there was just this instant, I would say, openness about Jim that that we felt like we could have a, this relationship uh, with a close relationship with a coach and he invited us in his office and then and and, and, and and you know he backed it up you know a lot of people say hey come and visit me if you need help you want to talk but anytime that we needed to talk he would drop what he had to do yeah that he would have that conversation with him and uh you know, you know that's that's what make it was so different back then for us is that we actually had a strong relationship with our coach. Yeah. Okay. So we got through the recruiting. Now we're going to move into, you know, the first couple of years, first few years of college kind of go through, you know, obviously won that adjustment, you know, Jimmy V's coming in now talk about those first couple of years while you were at state and kind of, you know, your expectations and then what it kind of ended up being for you as a college player. Well, my first year, you know, I, I came in all with all the good intentions. I was a pretty, I was a good student trying to do the right things. And then just like nobody tells you, you know, nobody tells you when to get up. Nobody tells you when to go to class. Nobody tells you that you got a good, good grade. They just, you kind of just go through and, uh, you know, it, you know, do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so did I regret because I came in with the good intentions of being a good student. And I remember the late Frank Wheaton, who was in the, uh, in, um, uh, in the uh, media office telling me that, hey, your first semester, you got a chance to be, you know, you could be an academic All-American. I said, well, academic All-American, man, I just want to play, you know, because I had good grades in my first semester, but I fell into the trap of following people and just doing the status quo. Mm -hmm. And so in my first year as a, as a, you know, you know, we went 20 and eight in our first year and uh, lost to Iowa in that first round in Greensboro, which we thought, we had the track to track to really go to the final four. We had a good enough team, but the disarray of, of, of Coach Sloan leaving and going through that whole thing was, you know, it's a bittersweet because we had a really good year, 
but we had an opportunity maybe in my first year to go to the final four, but that didn't happen. So my first year was um, good and, and somewhat disappointing at the end. The second year was, you know, we're going to wait and see because we got this new coach. It's got a new team, new mm -hmm. philosophy. Who is this Jim Valvano about? <clears throat> Where's, what's the future lies with our team? And, and so the first, the second year was a transition year. Yeah. Now, did you feel like the transition was, you know, different going from a different coach or do you feel like it kind of started to click towards the end of the year or did you really feel, you know, we got to figure some things out my, for my sophomore year and then move forward, forward after this? Well, yeah, it's, it's all different. You got a new coach, new philosophy, good philosophy because it was been – you would love to play with Jim because he had a fast, fast breaking style that we get the ball up, you get it off the board, uh, point guard gets it, and either wing you pitch it up and you shoot it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Scott, you would have loved – you saw the championship game. You saw how we played. Yeah. We got most of our shots in transition. Yeah. I mean, you would have loved to play for him because it was pitch it up and shoot it, man. And, and, you know, people don't realize the best shot, the best three-point shot is when people are trans, uh, scrambling in transition. Yeah. And so we took those opportunities. And uh, so his philosophy fit us. And it was just a matter of getting used to it and getting the players and getting the team. But uh, uh, we enjoyed his philosophy. Play. We just didn't win very much that second year because of transition. But uh, we, we really liked what he was doing, what he stood for. And, um, and, and his whole philosophy and mostly his personality, he wanted to have fun. Yeah. He, he made practice fun. We shot the ball a lot. We, we scrimmaged a lot. He didn't do a lot of drills. He fit his philosophy is that the only way you learn how to play is through playing mm -hmm. five on five. And so we played a lot. We shot a lot. We worked on time and score in, in game time situations a lot. And so, you know, we were learning and building our team. So the, the second year was a good transition year and uh, leading up to our, to our next two years. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's go. I know this is the, the segment everybody will the want to hear. Um, we'll move on to the national championship year. You know, you're coming into the season. What was your expectation leading up to that season? Well, first of all, uh, we thought we was going to make a run in the third year. Uh, went 22 and 12, lost to Chattanooga in Indianapolis never forget that and you know there was a lot of heat on Valvano because Carolina had won it in 82 mm -hmm. so going into our senior year this is our last year there's some heat on Valvano because Carolina just won it mm -hmm. so they're waiting you know what is this guy going to do you know here here Carolina wanted you know what is this guy going to do and mind you let's just be honest Valvano wasn't a popular choice coming to NC State he was awkward. He was from New York. He was an Italian coming to the South. It was very awkward. Mm -hmm. I mean, Willis Casey to make that decision over Jim Valvano, who wasn't the conventional coach, that was a big decision. So Jim had won over Willis Casey that he was the guy. Mm -hmm. But that don't mean necessarily that he was the popular choice. Usually in coaching, Scott, when, you, when you're hired, half the people – when you hired half the people love you and half the people wanted somebody else. Yeah. So that was the reality about Jim Valvano being a coach. So I let the, my senior year was with Jim's third year was really a critical year for the program and for Valvano's future. Yeah. Now you get into the tournament, obviously as that was all going through. Cause I mean, I look back on, on mine and, at the point that I thought we could make a run the year I went to my sweet 16 was when we beat Georgetown in the second round. I was like, we may have a legitimate chance to go deep. At what point in your mind did you say, guys, we could really make a run here? Well, for us, you know, it was, a, it was a, for my career, you know, we got off to a great start. You know, I had the 27 and a half against Virginia. Then I got hurt and I was out mm -hmm. for 12 games. Yeah. Then I came back and we were trying to obviously scramble around and get back in it. And then we beat Wake Forest in 130 to 90 game the senior day. But for us, those three games went in the ACC. You got to remember back then, Scott, 
The ACC was the best conference in the country. Ralph Sampson was arguably the best player in the country. Mm -hmm. you, uh, uh, North Carolina had Sam Perkins and Michael Jordan on the same team. So the teams were powerful. So for us to go through the ACC tournament, beat Wake Forest, good team, beat the number two team in the country with Michael Jordan and Sam Perkins, and then come back and beat Ralph Sampson in the ACC tournament. I mean, it, it was nobody in the country we thought we couldn't we couldn't beat. Yeah. So after winning the ACC tournament, I mean, we thought that hey, I mean, we we got a chance to make a run here. Yeah. But we, to unbeknownst to us, we didn't know they were going to ship us out west <laughs> and, and and kind of set us up, played against. Pepperdine, great team, won their league. Then the next game we win, we're going to play against UNLV, great team, top five team. You know, next game, if you win that, you, you got a chance to play. You might play North Carolina, but then you're playing, you're playing University of Georgia is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dominic left the year before, so Georgia was very good. So, you know, we, we, we had a tough draw out there in West. So we didn't know what was happening. And, uh, you know, every game, it, it showed you that every game was right down to the wire. So, I mean, part of me makes me think, though, that also battle tested you because, you know, you're like, all right, there's some guys out here trying to dog us to send us out west. And then you kind of made a statement like we're not going to go away easy. So that to me, that might have even have actually helped you taking on those teams and having to go out there and win it. Well, it, it was a numbness about us. You know, when you go through – and you know how it is in competition. Once you get this momentum and this confidence that you're going to win, you just expect to win. Yeah. And, 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 and like when people thought when we were down six, Sydney Lowe's not in the game, we down six with no three-point shot, no three-point shot down six with their best free throw shooter on the line. There's no way in the world that – that people thought that we were going to win that game. Yeah. And we came back and won that game in double overtime, which is, which is incredible. And without one of the greatest point guards that played in state, Sidney Lowe had fouled out the game. Yeah. So we came back and won that game without Sidney, who was on the bench. That was an, that game, that first game was incredible for yeah. us to come back and win that game. Yeah. So battle tested, I think is, is one of the things that I think back on it. So you win a national championship Obviously, we had the 30 for 30, all that kind of took off and is, I mean, still to this day is a buzz. So how, let's start with, how did it change your life after all that happened, all the excitement, how did that change your life? Well, first of all, let me tell you uh, uh, an important part. I coached for a long time, as you know, assistant coach. I was a head coach at Wagner where we won the, the only NCAA tournament there. I was the first African-American coach to win a championship there. Uh, then I go on to Fordham, and we have a great, great year. Coming fourth place at Fordham. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, low budget, high academics. And for us, Fordham to come in fourth place in Atlantic 10 was, was unbelievable. Then two years later, I get fired. Mm -hmm. And everybody, it, 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 you know, I always say, you're not a man until you get fired, until you find out you know, what's your, your, your change of life. And, it, you know, I went 27 years straight in the profession without being fired. But it actually ended up being one of the best things that ever happened to me because uh, I got to realize that basketball is not all the – that's the only part of what I do and not who I am. Yeah. And uh, when I started to work with uh, ESPN and I got the idea to do this film with Jonathan Hawk, I said, this is a story that need to be told. So if I wouldn't have got fired and to continue to coach, I would have, I may have never been the executive director and, and put that film on the board, Survive in Advance. Yeah. So actually it was a good thing for NC State and for the country that we got the chance to tell that story for the world to see. Well, I can tell you it, I've got people that came up to me that, you know, my friends that didn't know, don't know, growing up in the end, didn't know much about NC State. That'll come up to me and say, hey, do you know about this 30 for 30? I'm like, I played there for four years, man. 
Come on now, you can't be asking me these questions. So not even just Wolfpack Nation, but just the whole world just watching it and getting that feel for, you know, that team and what they were able to accomplish is, is unbelievable. So after the, we're going to kind of stay with after the national championship and kind of what it was able to do for you, what kind of kept the connection? Because obviously you can tell how close you were to all your former teammates, you know, how close you were to your coaches. How, how hard is it to be able to keep those connections with the former players? And obviously we'll, we'll touch on a little later on, but as well as NC State. Oh, it's not hard at all. It's got to be in your DNA. Uh, I don't know if I was born with it. Uh, I was taught by my parents. It's part of my character. But, you know, I love people. I love connecting with people. Uh, the former players are, are like family. Yeah. Uh, if you connect to NC State, it's like family. Yeah. So it's not me being at NC State. For some people, it's a job for them. But it's a calling for me. Mm -hmm. I'm, re I'm really paying it forward, giving it back. Uh, because I appreciate guys like yourself who's coming to NC State and not just be successful at basketball, but now you got an opportunity to use that and be successful in life. And that's what the key of what our obligation here at NC State as coaches administrator. Obviously, we want to help you be successful here while you're here. We want you to graduate and be a better person. But we also have to prepare for you for life after NC State. And I think that's the critical thing that we miss sometimes. And the yeah. kids don't understand. You don't compromise. You got to be the best student, the best player. You get the best experience and the best person you can be before you leave there. Because you know what? One day you're not going to play anymore. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't be successful at doing something else. That's just uh, being successful as basketball is part of who you are and part of your talents, but that's not all of what you can do and what you can accomplish later on. So use that, use that experiences to help you going forward, you know, because it doesn't always have to be in sports. Mm -hmm. There's so many other successful stories at NC state that guys are not athletes. Guys are not in the NBA guys are not in the NFL. I mean, who would you talking to a guy that I didn't know I was going to win an Emmy award. I didn't know I was going to be in filmmaking. I didn't know I was going to visit the white house uh, for the first African-American president and visit Ronald Reagan and visit the Pope. The experiences that I have being a part of the V foundation, one of the best uh, foundations in the, in the world. I, I didn't know all that was possible, but this is part of what I do. And part of what I learned through the experiences and the relationships of my experience at NC State. So that's what I'm trying to pass on the message to our kids today is that there's so much to get out of this experience other than just bouncing a ball or catching a ball. Because life after NC State is the key. Yeah. It's how you use it going forward to be successful. Yeah, and I can remember you know, when I was still on campus, when you would come in and, you know, you, you would talk with us, that's one of the first things you'd bring up is, hey, listen, basketball's great. Like, it's, it's awesome. But at the same time, you got to remember, you got to go out into this real world. You got to be a great person. You got to be able to take the things that you've done from basketball, your hard work, your passion for it, and take it to something else and then kind of create something else for yourself to have something after basketball. So, uh, you know, even when I went to the, your foundation, you could just see yourself just bouncing from person to person. I mean, every single person you were talking to them, having a conversation, just, you know, having that positive influence on any person you could touch. And I think that's one of the, the reasons that, you know, I'm happy to have someone like you that's still a part of NC State and with these young athletes coming through because that positive energy that, you know, you had an impact on me while I was there and you'll continue to have an impact on the people that are coming through. So you've, as we, you mentioned, you've, you know, coaching a little bit throughout your career, you were on three different coaches at, at state talk about 
the differences that you've seen in kind of the evolution of basketball to this point? Wow, very interesting. Great question. Never heard that question. Great question, Scott. Norm Sloan was a tough competitor. I mean, just, you know, you, you, his personality that we're going to be fighters, we're going to be tough, and nobody's going to push us around. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he had a different philosophy. And listen, Norm, you know, he had a unique experience because he played at state, he coached at state, he won the first national championship. So, you know, he, he had made his mark at NC State. Then you get Jim Valvano, who was this fun-loving coach, player's coach, guy that you know you can have this relationship he was just different in his own right but day one he wanted to win a national championship and he did and that's what he wanted to accomplish he loved nc state and then i come back years later and i uh, i come back again with jim so as a graduate assistant a full-time assistant with jim valvano again i see coach Valvano in a different light i didn't know this man personality was that dynamic Mm-hmm. You know, I got a chance to recruit with him and go him and see him in action. So it was different than a player relationship. Now I'm actually working with him. And at the time I went back to coach with Coach Valvano, he was also the AD. So that was a different experience of being with Valvano and not as a player, but actually working with him in a different capacity. Yeah. And then later with, with Coach Godfrey, well, I thought he came in with all the right intentions because of his experience with um, Herrick at UCLA and them, you know, winning the national championship and his relationship there. I think he had the right idea. He won. He, he really was serious about winning the national championship. He did. Uh, I would say in, from my estimation, in terms of the form of players, I think he did some good things with the formal players. No. I really think he had good intentions and uh, sometimes programs get away from you and things happen. But I think that Godfrey came in, listen, Godfrey was the one that brought me back. Yeah. I mean, he brought me back in the program and said he wanted to be a, be a part of the program. And I ain't heard that since I left. And so to me, I think he had all the right intentions to take NC state. And he did in four years, he went to two sweet 16s. And you and you and you were one of it. And you, you know, you guys had a shot. Once yeah. you get to the Sweet Sixteen, anything could happen. Exactly. So you had you had a shot uh, uh, to to get there. And so, you know, I got to commend Godfrey for that because you know it was here that he saw my value coming back to the program, and then he gave me that opportunity. And then later, when I became a moved to administration, uh, uh, Doctor Woodson and uh, Debbie Yao. I uh, saw that I can uh, be a value of the, the university and the athletic department. And really, they didn't give me a job. They gave me a calling. And yeah. the position is right for me. Um, I, I have multiple things I can bring to the table. And uh, I'm, I'm just happy to have this opportunity every day. Yeah. And I think uh, that's one of the things, especially looking back on, I had, that's one of the more fun things that I'd, kind of take for granted, I guess, is what, what I would say is having that opportunity to have former alumni. I remember there was always an alumni dinner while I was there. I mean, everybody would be there just, you know, hearing the stories and seeing, you know, all the former teammates that come together, how close they really are. Like now, uh, one may live in Nebraska and one live in New York, but they're still as close as they ever were talking stories and coming together because, you know, like you've mentioned before, it's, it's, it's the bond that you create with, you know, not only your university, but, you know, former teammates and alumni that you've met over the years. That is, it's a special bond that, that the former players, the, what we experienced together, that, that, that being a part of a team, that that's a special experience, something you would never forget. Yeah, you know, spending four years with, with 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 people and all that quality time, you you can you can never forget that, and that's why our eighty three team is and we we make sure that we get together once a year and 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 have that connection because it's 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 a special bond being a part of a team and your coaches, and I think we can do a lot better. I think we're doing okay with it, but I think we can do a lot better in our space and. You know what? You don't have to have 
uh, anybody to do it. I mean, former players can do it on their own. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes you can't wait for people to put things together. Listen, if I waited for somebody else to put together the 30 for 30, it might not have gotten done. Yeah. If I waited for somebody else to do the Derek Wittenberg Foundation to help juniors and seniors, it wouldn't get done. So sometimes you got to take the, you know, there's a few leaders within a group that's going to take the initiative and just make it happen. Yeah. You know, we we experienced something very special. We 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 went to a great school. We went to a great program. We made an impact. We need to come together because we want the other kids that come in the program to to feel what we feel and, and see the same things and get the same benefits from it because you know what's going to help them down the road yeah and i and i mean i even, even when i was playing pickup you know jordan collins would be there julius hodge would be there will roach would be there i mean just absorbing information and learning not only the game but the things that you know these are pros that have played you know professional basketball for eight, nine, 10 years that you can kind of gather that information and just become a better athlete and a better person. Well, you know, and, and, and not just that, and that's a good camaraderie for the guys who play. You got to remember there's a 99% who hasn't played. Yeah. And they are just as important as the guys who still playing basketball overseas in the pros, but the guys are on your teammate that are living their lives and their journeys and, and what they're continuing to to, to support their families and be successful in life. They're just as important. So I always speak to the 99%. Yeah. The 99% of the athletes, they're not only not going to play in the pros, but some of them are never going to play their sport again. Yeah. And so now the 99% of those people, listen, you're going to be successful too. Everybody can't be the entertainer. Everybody can't be the NBA guy, the NFL mm -hmm. guy. Everybody can't be the president. Everybody can't be a CEO but you could be successful in your own right. Find your passion, find your journey. And so I always speak to the 99% because we have to prepare them that life ain't over. It's yeah. just the beginning. Yeah, for sure. So I know we talked about it before we came on air. We got to talk, you know, the current team and, you know, we had a, a rough, rough week of it. So let's just start with what, what have you seen from them that, would be the first thing, you know, because we lost a couple games that they need to improve on. Well, watching the games, uh, number one, uh, obviously, uh, it's, it, you know, every year is a new, a new team. Uh, you lose CJ, you lose Markel, uh, two leaders, two guys that were very important, two guys that could score, but more sure it showed a lot of leadership. And so now you, you, you have a different team. You know, yeah. you have different roles. You got a lot more. Uh, freshmen playing now, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the experience, and it's a different team and, you know, different lineups and what have you. And just, uh, you know, just trying to find a way to win and, and to close games out, you know, because in ACC now, the games are going to come down to the last five minutes of the game. Yeah. You got to learn how to close that. You got to take care of the basketball. Uh, you got to make winning plays. And what this means is that, I've watched in the last four days, I may have watched 15 to 20 college basketball games. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how much I haven't seen kids taking charges. I haven't seen kids contesting shots. Yeah. I haven't seen kids diving on ball for loose, loose balls. Mm -hmm. uh, those are winning plays. I haven't seen contesting shots. I saw a uh, Texas game the other day for the game. The guy drives in on West Virginia and West Virginia's up one. The guy drives in, they kicks it to a guy and the West Virginia guy just stood there. Now this is for the game. And he just stood there and watched the guy take a shot. And to me, he didn't make a winning play. He didn't try to contest the shot. So to me, those are the things I learned about winning. Mm -hmm. It's the little things that you close the game out. Contesting shots, block out, time and score, taking care of the ball, taking charges. Those are the things that help you win games and more importantly, win championships. Yeah, it's easy to see the, uh, you know, 20 points per game or 10 rebounds, but it's the stuff that goes unnoticed, you know, that a lot of, a lot of players I can think of um, – 
CJ Williams was one of them for me. I mean, one would be leadership. You don't really see that, you know, just nope. getting guys together and talking about it. And then, you know, doing a lot of the dirty work, like you said, taking the charges, you know, holding players accountable, which is another thing I feel like now, nowadays, when you try not necessarily critique, but to tell someone, hey, you need to be a little better at this. They take that, you know, almost offensive and and take it personally, which it shouldn't be. It should be your teammate trying to help you to make the team be a better team in the future. So at, at, I think that's a little bit of the newer age coming in. Well, well, it's it's part of their indoctrination and in how they've been coached, right? Mm -hmm. Between the AAU and the high school coaching, you know, they haven't been coached hard. Yeah. Let's just be honest. They don't yell at them. You can't yell at them. They're sensitive. They don't think what you say to them is constructive criticism. If, if, if I said something to my teammate, I didn't care what I said to my teammate. And the reason why my teammates couldn't challenge me because I played hard. I wanted yeah. to win. I was competitive. It was hard to challenge me. Yeah. So I challenged, listen, nobody gave me the book of leadership. When the, when the time was something needed to be said, about winning, I said it. Mm -hmm. And whether I hurt feel and vice versa on me. If one of my teammates challenged me, the difference is, is that the kids have not been coached hard. Yeah. They, they, they just have it and they're sensitive and that's not the way to be. And if you want to win, if you want to win the championship, and I think coach Keats has got a unique young team, a mix of young guys and veteran guys that the veteran guys got to take more ownership in, in, in the team in terms of, you know, selling everybody down, especially doing, doing crunch time. Yeah. Because that's, that's when you're going to need the poise and taking care of the ball and making the, you know, what I call the winning plays. Yeah. And, and that's got to come from the leadership and that, you know, the coach is doing a good job, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the veterans on the team. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. All right. So I got, Three questions for you, and they're just kind of goofy questions. So you could take with it as what you want. So the first one is, who's the best basketball player to ever come out of DeMatha? Wow. Ooh, man, that's big. <laughs> well, it, it, it's pretty it's pretty easy. It's, 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 it's a tough one, but it's Adrian Dantley, I think for sure. You know, Kenny Carr is a – he played at state as a close second. He was a tremendous player. So I think it's, you know, uh, Adrian Dantley, 13th in the NBA in scoring, great yep. player, all American at Notre Dame. It's hard to deny him uh, in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but Kenny Carr was pretty damn good too. And, and, uh, <laughs> so he went to NC State. But, uh, but yeah, I would say Adrian Dantley be hands down. Well, there, there's our homework. For anybody that doesn't know a lot about DeMatha, just look it up and just look at the list of studs that have come out of there. So let's let's go. I've asked this to everybody. This is like my question that I asked everybody that comes on, and it's probably the hardest one you'll have, honestly. Favorite place to eat on campus? <laughs> wow, the, the, the campus has changed, man. I, I know. But, but listen. There was only one place to eat at campus. What I ate there was Case. <laughs> Let's hear it. We'll say when I when I say campus, I mean we'll we'll broaden it out to like within distance that you can get to. You know, maybe oh, short. Oh, no, no, no. The, the, the favorite place uh, uh, at my day on campus was Emilio's. Yeah, there you go. That was that's that was the number one place to eat, brother. I mean that's that was an easy one, man. I thought that was hard. It was. A, that's a Medios, baby. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've had I've had an Medios already. I've had the Clues Cloney, uh, and then I had I think somebody said the Chick Fil A, but uh, that was Stotts. And oh Stotts yeah, yeah. he's yeah, a younger that, guy, yeah, that's so that's new. that's new. That's the nah Chick Fil A, nah the Medios, baby. There you go. All right, here's the here's the last one. All right, former NC State basketball player. Out of all the former NC State basketball players, who is the best golfer? Ooh, that's a good question. The guess the best golfer that I know of. Uh, who's the guy that lives in uh, McGregor? He played in my tournament. Ben McCauley. Ben, I think it's got to be Ben. 
<laughs> I mean, out of all the guys that I know, Ben, I saw Ben. I said, Ben, you gonna, you gonna, you gonna bust the ball, man. You can't hit the ball that far. Yeah, I would say, as far as I would know, now Spud went pretty good. Uh, Spud's pretty good. Oh, I tell you who, I tell you who the best golf is. I tell you who the best golf is. Forget about Ben. It's Terry Harvey, the former quarterback. <laughs> have you seen him play? I have not. He is a partner with what he's a partner in a, um, a real estate company with with um, with Chris Corciani. Okay. He he has all the quarterback records at NC State. Terry Harvey, he's the best NC State golfer. I'll take him over anybody. There you go. All right. We, we, we've got a decision. So that, that, that's my next step. So when, when COVID calms down, I've had it in the back of my mind that I'm going to get an NC state, uh, former athlete team golf to play golf. And then I'm going to get a UNC and a Duke team. And we're going to do a Ryder cup style tournament somewhere. That's my goal. The, and I'll be the coach. There you go. That, 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 that's my see, goal. I, I think I'm good. I'm no good. Hey, but I think I'm good. It, we'll, we'll make you good. That's all that matters. We'll make you good. We'll make sure that you're good for, for, so for any you, tournament. Ben McCauley. Uh, oh, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what the team is right now. It's you, Ben McCauley, Terry Harvey, and Corn Robinson. Corn Robinson's good. Corn Robinson can knock the ball to the moon. Now it might be over here on 421. <laughs> but, <laughs> hey last time no. i played with him he kept it pretty much in the fairway he i think he played one over he played no, no, i mean no. he played he's, great no, he's really good he's really good he's he's really really good now terry uh, yeah that's a good team i'll take that team on i take that team on the road i'll take that team on the road <laughs> ben you um uh corn and terry i'll take that team yeah, uh, we, that'd be a we'll good team. And I know, team I know there's a lot better ones out there too. So we'll 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 figure something out and put something together. So, but I appreciate you coming on. I mean, I had a blast. I mean, it's anytime we can get you on here, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. I mean, obviously, the impact that you've had on the university and everybody coming out, you know, obviously I thank you, and I know there's a lot of other people that thank you. So thanks for coming on and everything you've done for for the for NC State. Well, I appreciate it. I ain't done yet. Oh, for sure. Done yet, buddy. We got a lot more work to do for sure. For Wolfpack Nation and for our students and student athletes and former players and everybody. So happy new year, brother. I appreciate you. Year. And uh, you keep doing what you're doing. Your, your future's bright. And I certainly appreciate you coming to our tournament and great community event and everything. And uh, hey, I tell you what we need to do. We need to put a former players tournament together. How about that? I'd like that too. We need to just get a former players and just go have a big old brunch whenever we can get some people. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. I'm going to put that together. All right, perfect. All right, go Pack. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Take care. Great. Go Pack.